faith are challenged to be honest about our past. Our pretense of concern for others is tainted by self-interest. Our great plans are compromised by little deceits. God judges as well as upholds. Surely all of us need to seek forgiveness. Will you join me in the unison prayer of confession? You know us, God, better than we know ourselves. We know the ways we speak and manipulate for our own advantage. You are aware of how often our deeds fail to match the faith we claim. Help us to face ourselves with honesty. Give us the will and courage to change our ways. We give thanks for Christ's intercession for us. We rejoice as the Spirit gives voice to all we cannot express. Save us, O oh God, that our lives might give expression to your reign. Amen.
concern. Uh, our gospel reading uh, is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 31 to 33, and verses 44 and 45. And uh, that will be up here since we're not using the few Bibles. Let us continue to listen for God's voice as he speaks to us through his word. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. And another translation says 60 pounds of flour. Then down to verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid, that in his joy he goes and sells all he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Again, I apologize to those who are listening on uh, Facebook and YouTube. If there is a little bit of uh, lag, it's because we're using mobile internet right now because our cable didn't hook up. So uh, if, if, if there are lags and there are problems, I will repost it this afternoon from the report. The hidden things. A telemarketer called the home one day and a small voice whispered, Hello? Hello, what's your name? Still whispering, the voice said, Jimmy? How old are you, Jimmy? Four. Good, is your mother home? No, she's busy. Is your father home? Yes, but he's busy too. I see, who else is there? Police? The police? May I speak with one of them? Where is he? And you have a grown ups there. The fireman? May I speak with the fireman, please? They're all busy. Jimmy, all of those people in your house, and I can't talk with any of them? What are they doing? They're looking for me. <laughs> Sometimes we know what we're looking for, like this little boy's parents and everyone else. We know its value and just how important it is. Many times, however, we don't know what we should be looking for because we are set on something much less than what the best would be. For the past few weeks and continuing today, Jesus has been talking about the kingdom of God talking about the message of the kingdom planted in different parts, then comparing the kingdom to a field where wheat and tares were planted together, and today using specific items to make clear God's kingdom to his hearers. How often do we get so involved in the business of life and of the church that we forget the mission of the church? How often do we get so involved in living with one another that we forget to love one another? How often do we get so wrapped up in being right that we forget to put on the righteousness of Christ? Maybe this is because we are looking for flesh, for something amazing, for something that's easy to attain and makes us feel good about who we are and what we have. I'm not sure. But what I do know is this. In life, 
The most important things are often hidden from easy view, from easy reach, and require sacrifice and commitment to find them and keep them. So let's look at Jesus' descriptions of the kingdom of God, that we might re-examine our own approaches to faith and to God, and so we might find God's best in our lives. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the expressions of my heart be acceptable in your sight. May my words not be a stumbling block, but may your spirit speak through me, touch each of us, Lord, and help us to hear what you are saying to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So in these stories, Jesus refers to the tiniest of seeds, a product that changes everything around it, around it a hidden treasure, and a fine pearl. What do these four things have in common, I wonder? They were either hidden or their appearance was deceiving. So how could something small do so much or be worth so much? I hope you'll be able to take away these things from the following. Number one, God's kingdom is antithetical to human valuation. Number two, God's kingdom changes everything it touches. And three, God's kingdom, when we truly find it, is worth leaving behind everything we had held to before. So number one, God's kingdom is antithetical to human valuation. In the United States, and in fact most of the world, we seek material things and experiences. Money, prestige, possessions, who marry, and if I had chosen wife or husband, what schools our children attend, with whom we network, and on and on and on. We look at the small things, the weak things, as meaningless and not very valuable, or at least not as important as the big things, and not really worth our time or priority. So it is with the seed mentioned here. How does something so small again? Make anything so large or meaningful. Now we don't know the future, but in the kingdom of God, small things are often most meaningful. Our culture looks to the successful individual, to the one who is financially set, to the one who seems to be the best or the most, to that which shines or sparkles or impresses. A small child, though, born to a young woman in a humble place, grew to become the savior of the world. Jesus told his hearers in Matthew 18, 3, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. In the NIV application commentary, it says this, Israel always believed that when God's kingdom was established on the earth, it would be great. They were not prepared for such an insignificant beginning. The reason Jesus was crucified. The character of the kingdom was unexpected, hidden, yet significant, and full of promise. Number two. God's kingdom changes everything it touches. Now, for those among us who don't or haven't baked yeast breads, we just like them, the secret of yeast might be unknown to you. Now, I can take the finest flour and other ingredients and mix them all together, but it will be nothing but flat bread if I don't add yeast, if I don't add a leavening agent, something to make the bubbles in there so that it's light fluffy and tastes really good. Excuse me. Sinuses are coming here. Yet a small amount of yeast, and I mean a small amount of yeast, put in that dough and work through it the right way makes a tremendous difference. It moves through the dough, spreading, and, and getting into all of it, and it rises 
as we prove it and then make it, and then we have the word of the word. <coughs> the thing about using yeast, though, it can be fussy. It takes attention and patience. Uh, you can't rush the yeast. You can't make it work. You can't throw it into cold water or anything, or hot water for that matter, or that medicine. It's going to be warm. And then you mix it together, and then you mix it in, and it works. But if you pay attention to that small bit of powder, it makes a tremendous difference in the loaf. So what is the parallel here? It is that small things make a big difference. A little yeast affects this flour, so this woman could feed over 100 people with that 60 pounds of flour, or however they said in this translation. The problem with yeast, however, is that it can work both ways. In other places in the Bible, yeast is used to refit, refer to evil intent. For example, in Matthew 16, 6, Jesus said, Be careful, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He was trying to warn them that the things we say and we teach and emphasize have effects that can go way beyond our intended focus for good or for bad. Now we might be tempted to look around at our small congregation and think we can't do anything, that nothing will work, that we don't have enough people or money or talents to make a difference. But the kingdom of God among us is like a small amount of yeast. If we treat it right, if we pay attention to it, it grows and it makes a difference. When we focus on the kingdom, when we allow God's kingdom to be the focus of our lives and our faith, amazing things can happen. And we can reach to and provide for many. It isn't about us, about our achievements, about our possessions, but about the kingdom of God working in us. So third, God's kingdom, when we truly find it, is worth leaving behind everything we had before. And he uses two examples here. First is a treasure hidden in a field. Now with the possibility of vandals and thieves and invading armies and the widespread poverty that existed, it was very common for people to hide their, their values, to bury them. And if they're anything like me, they put them in a safe place and then they forgot where they put them, right? And so this man comes along probably he was a tenant working a property for a wealthy man or more or something, and he comes across this collection of coins, this treasure hidden in the field. Instead of telling someone he found it, because finders keepers losers weavers, that really was the law then, he put it back, hid it again, and went and sold everything he had and bought that field so he could have that treasure. Think about hiding your money in your mattress and then praying the house doesn't look on fire. That's why sometimes thieves will rip off the mattress in the house because in past days, that's what people would do. But we all know the story. We put it somewhere safe, you can't find it, someone else does. He didn't steal it, he sacrificed for it. Likewise, the merchant looking for fine pearls. How many of you have shopped in secondhand stores looking for that rare dish, that rare piece, that one thing that you can resell? And I guess if Kay and Dwayne are watching, Dwayne does that. He goes and he buys stuff and then resells it and tries to make some money on it. I've been trying to sell my friend Pat's things for her. And um, let me tell you, it's not easy trying to figure out what's valuable and what isn't. But we know we look 
for, for men after men after men of dishes and crystal and paintings and such. And we see all of these things on Facebook where or these stories that come up that says, oh, this person had this old painting and they decided they wanted to change the frame. They took it apart and behind it was this original painting of $40 million. Like, why can't that ever happen to you? Right? Have you ever said that? Well, I have. And God and I have a little talk about that from time to time. Now, I remember when I was little, my granddaughter had a button hand. Did you have a button hand? Now, this was about this big around, about that high. And we had this picture, it was candy can at one time. And this woman with this big flowing gown that was made all of different candies, um, pictures of different candies. And I was fascinated with that, but then when I opened the can, when I would sit there with her and she was sewing, it was filled, I mean, filled to the top with buttons. All kinds of buttons. And I was fascinated with this. You know, there were some in there that were really shiny. And I thought, these are valuable. These are diamonds. <laughs> and I'm sure that one day when, when I inherited her button box, I would be able to sell them and make some money with them. Well, guess what? They were probably plastic. Anyway, they might have been glass, but I don't know. But we think, we look at things and we think, oh, that's valuable, that's valuable, that's going to be good. Well, he was searching. He was a merchant. That was his job to buy jewelry, sell jewelry, look for pearls. And then he came across this one. And he was probably sitting in a box with a bunch of other pearls. But to his trained eye, he recognized that this was something different. Something amazing. And he didn't tell the person how valuable it was. He put it back down and he went and sold everything he had because he recognized how valuable it was. Now see, this parable is about wealth and possessions. Neither of them are. But rather about the value of the kingdom as opposed to other endeavors, other possessions, other lifestyles, other dogmas, other traditions. These two parables, the treasure in the field and the pearl of great price, each emphasize to us once again the truth that if we value the kingdom of God, possessing it requires sacrifice, a reshaping of our priorities, and a willingness to do whatever it takes to be a part of that kingdom. So in conclusion, a sermon is only as good as its application to the lives of its hearers. So what do we take from these parables? What effect will this message have on any of our lives? Well, I believe that Jesus, once again, is calling us to turn away from the dead values of this world, the measurements that our culture provides, and to turn again to Christ's teaching to the Bible's demands on our lives and our hearts and our actions. Whether it's the widow's might or a child's faith, small beginnings of the kingdom will spread and change everything with which it comes into contact. Your life, your choices, your words will bloom one way or another and grow and spread to all those around you. So if our choices are to draw near to God, to choose the kingdom principles of love for God and neighbor, even in small ways and with small steps, those around us can't help but see God's kingdom emanating from us. We live in the kingdom so that God and people will want to have they will want to have what we have, sorry. They will want to experience the joy that comes from giving our all to God. Which brings us to the treasure and the pearls. What then are we willing to sell or set aside to empty out of our hands so that we can grasp the kingdom of God? Hopes and dreams may be less than God's desires for us. Personal affronts and self-righteousness, desires or opinions.
opinions, however good, that separate instead of unite. These men sold everything they had to gain the true measure of value. I want to close with this poem um, from an unknown source as my closing prayer. I did print handouts so you can take notes, but I couldn't pass them out. Um, this poem is on the back, so if you want to call me away, you can grab one. When I stand at the judgment seat of Christ and he shows me his plan for me, the plan of my life as it might have been had he had his way and I see how I walked him here and I checked him there and I would not yield my will. Shall I see grief in my Savior's eyes, grief though he loves me still? Oh, he hath me rich, and I stand there poor, stripped of all but his grace. While my memory runs like a hundred thing down the paths I can't retrace. Then my desolate heart will well nigh break with tears I cannot shed. I'll cover my face with empty hands and bow my uncrowned head. Now, Lord, the years that are left to me, I yield them to your hand. Take me, make me, mold me to the pattern thou hast made. Lift 
out each of these on our list and those whose names have not been mentioned but are in our hearts. We pray, O oh God, that you would send your missionary angels as you have promised to each of them to help them to know they are not alone, to help them to know that you are there with them and that your love belongs to them. We pray that you would send healing, comfort, assurance, and peace. We pray for their family members and their caretakers, that you would give them strength and hope. And Lord, we pray for those who care for us, who protect us, for first responders, for our military, for medical personnel, for all essential workers, Lord, that you would give them the comfort and strength to know that what they do does matter, that you would give them wisdom to do what must be done, and Lord, that they would come to know you. We pray for those who struggle with PTSD, who have seen things no one should see, who have experienced things that no one should have to remember or think of, that God, you would heal them, that you would deliver them from the memories that chase them down, and help them to find peace in your arms and in your strength. We pray for our brothers and sisters in faith throughout this world who are persecuted for their faith in you, that you would give them strength and protect them and give them courage as we pray for us to speak your word, even when it's unpopular or dangerous. We pray for our government, for our country, that you would give our leaders wisdom, that you would help us to listen to one another, that you would help us to find peace and unity, especially among your people, the people of the kingdom. We thank you. And pray especially for Joe and Brother Kennedy and their family on the loss of Joe Jr. Comfort them, O God. And we pray for this, uh, for Michaela, for this tumor that she will have surgery on, that you would guide the surgeries, the surgeons, that you would help Jenny in her surgery as well, that we would hear good news. And we thank you in all of these things and pray in the words your son Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have debt against us. Bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And continuing with our prayer, the prayer of the church. The day by day, dear Lord, of the history of the sweet prayer, to see more clearly. Love me more dearly, follow me more dearly, and pray for my We gather and offer, not so much to support an institution, but to follow our passions to share the good news of the realm of God with one another and with many who have never heard of it. Amid an atmosphere of deceit and distrust in the world, where community is so seldom realized in our day, we aspire to discover and live God's will for us. Let us give generously to our tithes and offerings we give to support our common mission. Let us consider our commitments to God and the church.
precious to us, O oh God. It is worth our greatest efforts and our careless sacrifice. As we search for the best in life, we also want to share our faith discoveries with friends and neighbors. We do that personally and with our giving. May our outreach proclaim to all that nothing can separate us from your love. We give you thanks that you have entrusted to us all that you are privileged to share. Amen.